Cool. What's up? Welcome back to Lightweights. If you're new here, make sure to hit the thumbs up button. Make sure to subscribe. Today's guest, all around bad, and has a cool, <laughs> cool, cool story. He's an author, a television show host, conservationist, member of the Australian Defense Forces, shark attack survivor, Paul DeGelder. G'day. How's it going? Good. You have three books here, too. Yeah. Yeah. It's been uh, uh, it's hard to write a book. Have you ever tried? You made it so easy. You have three. Yeah. Well, uh, no. I, the hardest part is like deciding to sit down and start writing. Once you're there and you're sort of like, oh, yeah, I got this story and I got this, app, you know, talking about sharks and this awesome adventure I had. In the middle. It's okay. But uh, sitting down to write is probably the hardest bit. Um, and so, you know, I did the first book in Australia, No Time for Fear. And it never got released in America. And I was living out here and I was like trying to embrace my new country and all these cool people I was meeting. And I thought, you know what? I need to redo No Time for Fear. So I sat down and I, I rewrote it, uh, uncaged, and added the last eight years of all the Shark Week adventures as well. And I'm not a professional writer. So I have this really good friend of mine, Great Jones. He's a, a British soldier. He's also a ghostwriter for James Patterson, like New York Times bestseller, written heaps of books for other people his own fictional series about the romans fighting the gaul is like a legend so i gave him the, the 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 mess that i wrote and he turned it into that um and then he helped me with shark once uh, uh harper collins asked me to do that so i didn't i didn't do it all by myself you know sometimes you need help I listened to the shark one. You have such a great voice for the audiobooks. Ah, oh, thanks, man. It's so badass. You I listen back it? to it and go, cringe. No, not at <laughs> all. I was listening to it in the gym, like, motivated. Nice. Yeah. Awesome. So, what's the reasoning that great white sharks can't live in aquariums? Because I know there's no proven case where they've actually lived there. <sighs> Why can't they? Um, I think. I, honestly, I don't know. I would be guessing. I'm not even sure scientists really know. I think the any wild animal forced into an environment like that where their natural habit is to migrate, uh, they just don't fare well. Like their instinct is to travel, to hunt, to mate. And if you take that purpose away from an animal, then it has no reason to live. Uh, great whites migrate. You know, they've swum from Western Australia to South Africa, from Eastern Australia to Hawaii. You know, that's huge distances. And then you try and put them in a little pond, no animal thrives like that. Even, you know, the orcas, they're hugely intelligent animals. And so maybe that they live a little longer, they can, uh, they get trained, so they get mental stimulation, but they also eventually die. You know, recently, Miami Aquarium, one of them died, and they live in the, the worst scenarios man you look at the the map of miami sea aquarium or sea life or whatever it is you see the parking lot and then you see the tank that the orcas and the dolphins stuff live in and it's like that's where their priority is the parking lot to get people money and not the well-being of those animals and so i just think any wild animal forced to live in an environment like that just suffers and can't survive right it's awful yeah Yep. Speaking of the migration, you did a show on Shark Week about just more sharks coming to Florida because of the warm water. Mm. Are they searching for the warm water? I think they just uh, go to the warm water because that's where they know the food is. Um, and so I'm about to go to Australia and do that same sort of thing. They think that the bull sharks in the harbor uh, are staying longer, pot uh, potentially making that more of a long-term home instead of coming out of the harbor and migrating up north because of the warm water, because the warm water brings the life, meaning food. Right. So if you have a ready source of food, why would you go anywhere else? Same reason that, um, you know, it's getting warmer water, it's getting warmer further up the east coast of America. So the Burmese pythons that were introduced, you know, they lived in Florida, they're decimating populations of native wildlife. They've been discovered traveling further and further up north because the water, the, the uh, temperature is getting warmer. So life is becoming more habitable for them so i do think uh they're not coming because it's like yeah let's go hang out in hot tub water it's warm so i like the temperature it's just because that's where the food is do you do any work with the reptiles no 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 i've got some friends that i work with on shark week that do that stuff I, they call what are they called uh herp, herp herpetologists Herpeto yeah herpes. they go uh, herp they're called herpes they go, they go and lift up trays and there's like cobras and they travel all around the world one of my buddies dev and mason just went to south america they're wild like this dude went out to the amazon with his wife uh with this um 
guide, the guide got him lost. They were wandering, starving, lost in the Amazon. His wife got bitten by a snake. She's dying. Was it like, venomous? Yeah. <gasps> yeah, she's like literally dying, throwing up, dysentery. He had to carry her out of the Amazon. Like, that's wild. Like, I just get in the ocean and swim with sharks. You want to go into the wilds of the Amazon where everything wants to eat you and kill you and there's dysentery, disease, and malaria. I'm like, I'm good. Like, so that's I like, scary I like to you? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Like, I guess it's anything that you've learned about, you've learned to deal with, that becomes less scary. So the things that I did in the military would be terrifying for most people. You know, in a plane with a hundred other dudes in the middle of the night, five hours, tactical flying, and then all of a sudden at 1 a.m. you've got to jump out of a, a black, empty rectangle into nothingness with a parachute that you fall at 15 feet per second. You can't see the ground. You know when you're going to hit. You've got a 100-pound pack attached to you. Then once you land, you got to walk 40 miles in the middle of the night. So you it's did like, all that? Yeah, yeah. I, I was in the military full-time for 12 years, Army, Airborne, and then uh, Navy clearance diver. So it's kind of like one of our roles is uh, underwater and land-based ba uh, explosive ordnance disposal, so like bomb disposal. Um, attack swimming in the middle of the night on pure oxygen rebreathers, kind of like the SEAL stuff. So that sort of thing for most people is terrifying. Um, but because I was trained, because you learn about it, you know, knowledge dispels fear. So the more you learn about something, the less you fear it. And that's kind of what I'm doing with sharks. You know, I'm, I want to teach people about this incredible animal that's vital to the ecosystem. You know, they're not man-eating monsters lurking the coast waiting to snatch your children. They're, they're an essential part of the ecosystem, the environment. And that's their home. You know, they say, oh, this water shark infested waters. I'm like, no, this human infested waters. You know, that's the problem. We're, we're injecting ourselves into nature. And as humans do, we go overboard and we just decimate everything in our path. So we need to become a little more at one with the native environment uh, that we're, we are really having a go at. What kind of bomb disposal is there in Australia? Um, so we do the training in Australia to mostly do it overseas. Uh, so when the Iraq war was going on, um, before I was in the clearance divers, the, they were going out and getting rid of the, the mines in the harbour. Uh, we do land-based bomb disposal as well. So, you know, like that movie, The Hurt Locker, very Hollywoodized, but that's the gist. You know, clearance divers were going through Iraq and Afghanistan, getting rid of landmines and IEDs and bombs. Uh, we'll go out to the Solomon Islands um, once every two years or so like uh, for a three month trip and we'll get rid of uh, the, the bombs and IEDs left over from World War II that are still there and they're still active they're still active yeah <sighs> yeah. and so the kids will go out there and, and play with them and you know the fishermen will find them and take the explosives out of them which is extremely dangerous at this point in time they're hugely volatile and they'll use those explosives to blow up the reef and like kill fish and all that sort of stuff so we go out there to try and get rid of them to keep the people safe that's wild. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's so interesting, man. Coming from being a, like a grunt, a soldier, where you have like one real job, you know, hunt and kill other humans. Uh, <laughs> also peacekeeping to a job where every day could be different. One day you're training to blow stuff up, get rid of bombs, attack swimming. We're using tools underwater, like underwater welding, cutting guns to... Uh, you can join the counter-terrorist team called Tag East, which is the domestic counter-terrorism team. And that's, you know, full black overalls, gas masks, automatic MP5s, throwing flashbangs, kicking indoors, training to kill terrorists. So it's amazing. It was so much fun. And then you turn up to work one day and a shark eats you. <laughs> yeah. That was unexpected. Are you still part of that now? Uh, no, I, I served as a um, uh, reservist for another five years. But when I came out to America, you know, I've been here seven years. Right. Very hard to stay in touch and do the work that's required. So uh, I left that behind, came out here and just started on another path. Uh, you know, I was trying to find a, a way to be of service, have purpose in it, because that's, that's what life's about. You know, finding a purpose, being of service and having value. And so Discovery Channel gave me a contract, gave me a job uh, to work on Shark Week. And I thought, you know what, I, I want, never lived in another country before except when I was peacekeeping with the UN. I'm like, I want to try this out, this America place. You know, I've grown up watching it. I love to live there, the land of opportunity. Let's just see what happens. And so I came out and I was like back and forth every couple of weeks, you know, the 14-hour flight, you know, speaking job in America, speaking job in Australia, a year and a living in an Airbnb 
every time just everything I owned in a car one in Australia one here and I was just 14 months later I'm just like oh, I am so sick of this fucking flight and uh, I just made a decision called it cut out all my Australian speaking jobs got an apartment flew my dog out and set up shop here and man I've had the best time you know I've met the most amazing people I've got to work with incredible people like you and Dave and all the crew we got to go and have some fun scare the shit out of your friends uh, <laughs> yeah, what's, what's uh, the, the girl's name the Natalie? Uh, na- no, the other one. Um, Susie. Susie. Yep. She did not like me at the no. end of that trip. No. Man, she was cussing me out on that <laughs> boat, throwing up. That was fun, though. Yeah, we met on Shark Week. Yeah. So when you got attacked by a shark, you were doing a military exercise? Yeah, yeah. So there was new equipment that they were trying to introduce. So it was unmanned video on sonar. So the goal was put it on a wharf, put it on a ship anywhere around the world and turn it on. And there was an automated video that would detect motion on the surface of the water. Uh, and there was an automated sonar. So that would detect surface under the water in case it was an attack swimmer or a diver. And so they needed to see if it worked. So me and my, my three teammates were testing it. We were the attack swimmers to see if it could pick us up. And so, yeah, we were just, it was a boring job. You know, it wasn't anything exciting. Um, early in the morning in Sydney Harbour, just swimming from point A to point B. Uh, I had my new guy in the water first and I pulled him out to give him a rest and I took over. Uh, and every time I got in the water with the Navy, I was terrified of sharks. Yeah, every time to the point where I was like, my buddies would mess with me and they'd put pictures of great whites on my locker. And <laughs> But, you know, it's like, this is, I got a job to do, I got a task. So put that fear to the back of your mind, focus on what you actually need to do and try not to think about it. That's so interesting, you were scared of them beforehand that my biggest fears in life were sharks and public speaking so were you facing your fears did you join that branch in the military to face your fears no i just didn't want to be a dirty smelly soldier anymore <laughs> i just <laughs> i wanted to try something bigger and you know the biggest things in the australian military are commandos sas and the clearance divers didn't want to be a dirty soldier anymore i was sick of the army so i thought you know what i'll go from the skies to under the sea like i'm a, i grew up swimming my dad was a swimming coach and a cop so i'm like I, I'll be all right. I'll give it a go. Never dove in my life before I joined. Uh, but I loved it. I found something that I was truly passionate about. Underwater, people say they get claustrophobia. And for me, it's the, it's the opposite. I feel so free, like this huge open space and slow moving. And it's just calming. The sen- No one can talk to you. It's quiet. You see these weird aliens floating around everywhere. I'm like, I feel like an astronaut going to another planet. That's what I loved about it. And then, you know, you add the excitement of bombs and doing all manner of crazy stuff. And it's like, oh, this is the best. Are you deactivating them underwater? Yeah. yeah there's, so there's a couple of things you can do. We, we call it bipping. So blow in place. So you can, we go up to a mine. There's multiple different types of mines. You've done this? Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Um, but you have to be careful because they can be activated seismically. So through um, vibrations in the water and on the seabed, magnetically. So metals, certain metals can set it off. So we have to dive on a, a, a min mag, minimum magnetic diving suit um, with mixed gases so we can go really deep and, uh, and then um, uh, acoustically. So a mine can be programmed so that the boats that you own can go over it, no problem. But as soon as it detects the sound of a specific ship, say an American warship, it will activate. Yeah. And then they have uh, anti-diver tempering devices as well. So they know that divers are going to come and try and get rid of them. So they set these little things where if you mess with it, the diver will actually set it off. So you have to be aware of all of those things. So there's a lot of training involved. And so bipping is like, we'll basically swim up to it. We'll have like a piece of plastic explosive on a stick and we'll try and get as close as we can, put the, the plastic explosives on it, set a timer, get out of there and blow the thing up um but if it's something new maybe it's a new mine we haven't seen or something like that we'll we'll retrieve it we'll put like a over pressurization charge on it blow the mechanical working parts apart and then take it to the surface drag it into shore remove all the detonation stuff and then we might study it and learn you know how can we better get rid of these bombs that's wild yeah yeah it's it's really interesting it's changing all the time Uh, obviously i haven't been in the military for 10 12, something like that years now. So you can imagine how much more advanced it is in a decade. So it's probably changed a lot since my time. What country left those bombs there? Oh, countries all over the world. So Iraq, mine, sea mined their ports so that no one could come in. 
the Japanese mind, the Americans mind, the old days, everyone mind. Uh, Australia has a rule where we don't do that because in the end it causes too much harm to the civilians because you can't track landmines. You can't keep an active, uh, accurate de- estimation of where you leave those mines. They might drift, they might get moved, like you might have sent too money in. So we, we don't do that because it's too harmful to once the, the conflict's over right. to the local people. Wow. That's crazy. Yeah. So you're doing your exercise out there. <laughs> it was a Wednesday. It was like six or seven in the morning. Uh, we were there at five to get briefing and stuff. So early morning, rode my motorbike to work, jumped in the Zod, a uh, little black inflatable boat called the Zodiac. And, we, you know, it's cool. It's like five o'clock in the morning, sun's still down. Me and my three mates cruise from the Navy base under the Harbour Bridge. You got the opera house there. It's like no one's up. It's quiet. It's just like those are the best times. You're like, yeah, this is sick with my boys cruising in the dark and uh, we pull up to the navy base where they have all the warships and stuff and we get our briefing and it's really simple you know like i said swimming from point a to point b pretending to be a tax swimmer so nothing crazy and they just wanted to test this equipment um so then i get in second and i'm swimming towards the bow of a warship just this sucks it's boring but in my head i'm like if a shark attacked me right now where would it be better to have my hands? Like, because we get trained, when we're doing our training, we cross them across our chest, to sort of make ourselves streamline, zip through the water. But I like to have my hands in the water by my side. I like to feel the water and you know, it gives me balance and stuff like that. So I'm like, if I have my hands across my chest like this, like I'm trained, a shark grabs me. If it grabs me by my body, my arms are pinned and I'm not gonna be able to do anything. If I have them by my side, you know, you know I, I don't know. And I turn to look in the other direction feel this thing hit my leg and I turn around like startled it didn't hurt just felt like pressure and there's this massive shark head attached to me now I, it wasn't what I was expecting like I'd never seen a large dangerous shark in real life before so I'm like well yeah it was my eyes turn into dinner plates and I'm like oh, oh what do I do what do I do what do I do um then I think okay I've seen shark week I've seen the crocodile hunter I'll jab it in the eye and I try, but my arm won't move. And I look down and I can see it's got my leg and my hand in its mouth at the same time. And I try and pull my hand. And I can see the flesh tearing a little bit with my the teeth embedded into my wrist. So then it hurts a little bit. I'm like, shit, shit. I try left hand. I can't, I can't reach the eyeball. It's just too far away. So I grab it by the nose and I try to lever it off me. But that, that doesn't work. It's got clamped down. So a, a bull shark, which it was, uh, I've done studies with this in the past. We've done pressure testing with great whites and stuff. Uh, a bull shark has a greater pressure of bite than a great white of the same size. So this thing is like latched. I'm not getting out of there. And so the only other thing I can think of is punch it in the nose. You know, you hear that. So I cock back. But the shark at that point decides, oh, I'm going to eat this thing. And it starts to shake me. And all the fight goes out of me. The pain was just incredible. Like, took every ounce of fight on, out of me. And it took me underwater, thrashed me. And I came back up and I'm like, oh, fuck, I'm going back down. So I take a big glass of air, go down, and it keeps thrashing me. And the pain just makes me scream underwater. And it keeps me down there for the... If you, you can see the shark attack, it's online. Uh, it got posted because I did so many tv shows about and they petition the military for it so you can see it if you go and google navy diver shark attack it, it'll eventually come up last eight seconds for me like i can go through this so slowly in my head and it feels like minutes and i'm underwater and i think to myself i'm not going home today like, i'm gonna die right now and it wasn't fear i just i, I said to myself are you ready to die and I, I look back to everything that I'd done. You know, I was a really lost kid, lost teenager. I was bullied my whole life. Um, and then I started fighting and drinking and stealing and all manner of terrible thing. I kicked out of home at 17, flunked high school, and I was selling weed. And you know, I got jumped by 20 dudes and I had to leave my hometown. And, you know, then I started working behind a bar in a strip club, became a rapper. Uh, and thought, you know, I thought I'd changed my life. I opened up for Snoop Dogg in 1998. I was like, I've changed everything. And then, you know, and then fell apart and I joined the military. And I was like, I've done so much good. 
You know, the military taught me to be a man, a good person of service. And then I found the clearance I was done so much cool stuff. I'm like, you know what? From where I came from to where I am now, I'm happy. You know, I've done more than I ever expected that I could have. And I'm like, I've lived 10 lives in these 31 years. If I'm going to die now, I'm ready to go. And I just let go. I was waiting for death. And peace came on me. And I accepted it. And I thought, you know what? This isn't the end. I can feel there's another adventure next. And then the shark, it's, it was thrashing me. Its teeth met in the middle of my leg and it ripped my whole hamstring out of my, my leg and it ripped my hand off. And my wetsuit made me buoyant. So I come to the surface. Uh, the, the shark is like, does this thrash? You know, it's whoo, taking off. And I'm like, oh my God, I'm not dead. I gotta get out of here. I, gotta, I see the safety boat and I start swimming and I take a stroke and I see that my whole hand is gone. My, my arm ends at the end of my wetsuit and my medical training kicks in. I think I've got to keep that wound above my heart to try and slow the be bleeding so I can get back to the boat and survive. Not knowing that my whole hamstring's gone, I've got an arterial bleed. I'm literally swimming back to the safety boat through a pool of my own blood with one hand and one leg. Uh, and I, I didn't think I was going to make it. I was thinking, this shark's going to come back. I was just waiting for it to grab my leg and pull me under. But you know, they teach you this laser-like focus. Complete your task. And so I was like, I have one job, get to that boat. And the, obviously my teammates had seen as well. So they're coming towards me, swimming back to the boat, one hand, one leg, probably not going anywhere. And the guys come in and they're like, they told me later, like the blood was so thick, we could taste it in the air when we got to you. They pulled me into the boat and I, I was so just so relieved to not get bitten and eaten anymore. Uh, I relaxed, passed out. And my teammate, Tomo, uh, all the guys did exactly what they were supposed to do. He thought I was going into cardiac arrest. So he's like pummeling me in the chest. You know, gotta wake him up. And it worked and I woke up and I see my hands gone, ripped off by a shark, blood everywhere. You wake up, you're in the boat? Yeah, yeah, like 10 seconds later while he's like stimulating my heart. And I see Tomo, Tomo's beating the shit out of me. I was like, my hand's gone. Tomo's beat me up. I'm like, this sucks. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna go home. <laughs> I should have called in sick. <laughs> But uh, yeah, like it was, it was a hard day. I nearly died a couple of times if it wasn't for my teammates, you know, and that training that I had, I was extremely fit. So my body, I guess, was used to relying on lowered amounts of oxygen in my blood. Um, I knew enough about medical stuff to know that I shouldn't look at my leg because if it was horrific, uh, that visual thing can put you into shock and shock can kill you. So I didn't look at my leg. I held onto my own arm to try and stem the bleeding. One of the guys was putting a tourniquet around the wound and I just stayed awake. And I'm like, as long as I can see Tomo, as long as I can hear his voice, I, I was still alive. And so it was like, as we do in the military, we're always trying to uh, lighten the mood. When things get serious, we, like, it's just instinctual. I don't know why. So I'm, I'm cracking jokes. I'm like, oh man, can you just make sure someone looks after my motorbike? I don't think I'm going to be able to ride with this leg. And he's like, shut the fuck up, Paul. You were dying. So just focus on staying alive. Uh, and so, you know, the paramedics eventually came, wished me off to hospital, and uh, I was unconscious for a few days. I went through 300 donations of blood, 150 liters. I could just, as soon as they put it into me, just kept pumping out of my body. So, you know, the, the, all those people that donate blood, you know, thank you. You save lives indirectly. Like, I've got three hundred different people's blood pumping through me. Apparently, <laughs> weird. Um, I was thinking afterwards. I'm like, am I going to have start having other people's memories and dreams? Um, but yeah, just very, very lucky to still be alive. Where was the blood going when it was? You said it just kept coming out of you. Yeah, so I'm on the hospital bed. It's just pouring out of my leg onto the bed oh. yeah because they couldn't stop the arterial bleed until they had they had found it because one of the guys before that actually had to stick his hand in my leg and pinch closed an artery otherwise i would have bled out there on the dock so you know with the tourniquet on they took me to the hospital and then they had to take that off to try and find that artery so until they found that i was just squirt 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 blood everywhere and did you have an idea of where your leg was bitten off in that moment no uh because the hamstring was gone and 25 centimeters of the sciatic nerve was gone, I couldn't feel a lot of it. I could feel pain all, the, all, all through my body, but I, didn't, I couldn't localize it. So I, I didn't know how bad my leg was. Uh, and I even had the leg for another week. You know, they'd put, um, they'd filled it with bandages and 
taped it up and all that sort of stuff so for the week i didn't know how bad my leg was all i knew was they put vibrating bandages on it to try and stimulate blood flow but i could see my leg but i couldn't feel my foot and it's a very strange feeling to be able to see it but you can't feel it you can't wiggle it and they'd come in to try and test the reflexes and they'd pin, like pin me in the bottom of the foot to see if i could feel it and i'd have to close my eyes and guess where it was and i was like oh i can feel it i can feel it but it was my mind playing tricks and it just got to the point after that first week where I had to make a decision. You know, the doctor came in and, and he did exactly what I needed him to do. He didn't bullshit me. And he left it up to me. You know, he said, you can keep your leg, but, you know, the muscle's gone, the nerve's gone. Uh, and that chunk will always be missing from your leg. We can skin graph over it, but basically you're going to be carrying that leg around like a lump of dead wood. Your happiness will suffer. Your motivation will suffer. Your fitness, will, everything will suffer. Alternatively, we can remove the leg and have you walking, potentially running on a prosthetic within 12 months. Uh, and I'm on ketamine and morphine at the same time. I'm high as shit. And I'm like, Doc, you can take my leg and just turn me into a Terminator. <laughs> and I was 100% serious because I was high and I thought you could do that. Um, so I, had, I decided to have the, the rest of the leg taken off. And I had, he was really nice. Like he took photos through the whole sequence of exactly how they did that. And I, so I have all the photos and I've been motivational speaking for years. And in the early days I used to show and talk through those photos, but I had 70 people pass out in my audiences over the years. Oh my God. Yeah. They, so I, I did a job for Microsoft in Australia once and it was like 120 people uh, standing room only and, and six people passed out. They wouldn't have passed out at Apple. <laughs> yeah, right, yeah. <laughs> we'll see. I haven't done a job for Apple yet. Um, yeah, the AV guy passed out over his control panel. They said it was the best conference they ever had. So, like, I, I felt bad. They are like, no, yeah, that was good. I can see yeah. some people <laughs> loving it, but I saw those photos. It's intense. Yeah, and so I've wound it back now. I only sh I show the Shark Attack footage and I show two photos to, like, really drive home how how serious it was and, and how amazing the human body is to overcome something like that. Uh, and so that was pretty intense, but I got to like 50 people and I'm like, I can't keep doing it. Like, yeah, it's so hard to get the audience's attention back when one of their friends has passed out. Everyone wants to know who. I've never had an American pass out. Now, I thought I did. I was doing a big conference. It was like 500 people and a guy passed out. And um, I was like, oh, my first American. And his table yelled out, he's Canadian. <laughs> so yeah, I, I don't like people passing out anymore. Um, but it, it, you have to show that. You have to show people the realization of what can happen and also what we can overcome. Yeah. You know, the, the human mind and the human body is far greater a tool than most of us even realize. How far away were you when you had to swim back to the boat once it happened? Probably uh, six, 700 feet. I don't know feet that well. About 200 meters. Did it feel like forever? Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I was like, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to die. I was like, I'm not making it to that boat. But also the boat was coming towards me as well. So it didn't take as long, anyway, near what I thought. But you know, we're in those moments where you're like fear of death and agony like that. You know, and people say that you can't remember pain. You can, yeah, you can. Like absolute agony. It's funny, people ask me if it, if it hurt. And I thought that was the stupidest question for a long time. But then I thought about it, I'm like, hey, yeah, shock and all that sort of stuff. Okay, it's reasonable. But then I'm like, kick that coffee table that big wooden coffee table as hard as you can with your bare shin and then times that by a million. And it's like a pain that is so huge and overwhelming, you, you really can't grasp it. Like, and you, the fact you can't stop it, you, you become a total victim to it and it's, it's horrible. You can't imagine pain like that. I feel like you've overcome it so much, right? Mm. Does it... What feeling do you get when you relive it and you reshare those stories? Are you just numb to it now? I try not to be because then I feel like I'm not. I, I see the story as a message, a lesson, a way that I can teach people about life and fears and all that sort of thing. And so no matter how many times I talk about it, I, I always try and give as much as I can uh, of emotionally for that. So I don't really become numb to it. Um, but I've never had nightmares. I've never had flashbacks. Uh, it doesn't worry me. I think the shark attack was never a problem for me. Losing the limbs, as much as it sucks and it's made life very hard, 
um, the biggest thing that I was afraid of was losing my purpose and my value, losing my career, losing my purpose for being. Like, who am I if I can't do my job? You know, I didn't have anything before that work. And the only reason I could do that work was because I was so physically and mentally able. So if you take away my physical physicality, what do I have to offer the world now? That was my biggest fear. And so, you know, I'm nine weeks in hospital. I just made a decision that I am not going to give up that life. I'm like, I'm going to show the Navy that I can still do that job by any means possible. Like I know pain, I know hardships, I know how to push my body and my mind beyond what my, most people can do. I'm going to focus on that because I don't have anything else to do. I was laying in a hospital bed for nine weeks and I'm like, I'm going to train. So, you know, I was, couldn't get out of bed and I saw the bar above my bed. So I'm trying to do one arm chin ups on that bar. Eventually I could stand up and my mates were awesome. They came in, bought weights, protein, TheraBand so I could exercise. Uh, and we didn't have a, uh, we don't have a medical military hospital in Australia. No rehab hospitals, nothing like that. So I, I just went home. And one of my best mates from high school moved in with me and he looked after me and drove me to the gym uh, at the army base. So every day we would go into the gym, but having one leg and one hand, you know, that, that really throws out your bench press and squats. And so I had to relearn slowly how to use my body in a new way. And then uh, eventually I got the leg prosthetics, I got a weightlifting arm. And so that really helped, but you know, I had to learn new ways to exercise. I, I couldn't do push-ups because I couldn't weight bear on the end of my arm. Um, but the army, back in, way back in basic training, you know, 2000, they taught me improvise, adapt, and overcome. Because you're not always going to have the tools that you need in, in the scenarios that you're working in. Um, so you have to utilize whatever it is that you have at your disposal to accomplish that goal. And so, okay, I got to improvise. You know, I pull in a bench and I put my elbow on that bench and I do push-ups like that. Um, I looked on the internet, you know, the wealth of the world's knowledge in a few keystrokes. Like there's so much information you can gather on that. And I started looking up things, tools that I could use. And eventually, you know, the, the more I did that, I looked at Paralympians that were doing incredible things in sport. And I was like, okay, if these people can do it, there's no reason that I can't do it. There's no reason that we all can't overcome something. Like find someone that's going through the same thing as you find out how they're achieving that goal, just replicate it. Like we don't have to recreate the wheel. We don't have to go through so many failures anymore because there's so much information online that we can just grab that, those information bites and utilize everything that someone else has already gone through the pain to develop. And so that's all I did. I just copied and replicated these incredible people. And the more I accomplish, like, you know, we all have to have goals, whether they're tiny little achievable goals, like I had to start with. Um, or they're big, impossible dreams, like me going back to the Navy. You have to start somewhere, and you have to set those goals to lead you up to that impossible dream, because it's not like, oh, I'm going to go mountain climbing, and I'm just going to go do Everest. You know, no one does that. You just start small and build, and the more that you accomplish those little goals and challenges, the more you can look back and go, shit, look at what I've done. You know, that buoys you, gives you motivation to do more. And so that, you know, doesn't always work sometimes you fail and you go back and you have to reassess what you're doing and eventually you know i'd accomplished everything and i asked the navy if i could go back to work uh, i was like no doubt i can do this and they said no i was like what do you mean no I'm like you can't go back to the teams to be the at the teams you have to be deployable for war i was like look i understand that i'm not i'm not as fleet on my feet as i once was you know all my trigger fingers work at once i'm i was right-handed so now so many things but I said to them, why won't, why won't you let me go to the dive school? Let me teach the next generation of divers. You know, don't waste all this money and effort you've put into me. Let me inspire and teach and provide this knowledge that I have up here to the next generation. Maybe inspire them, maybe take them to the next level. And so they're like, all right. And they maybe jump through all these hoops and I achieved every single one of them eventually and I ended up going back to work as a full-time instructor. Turns out, I hate teaching people. <laughs> <laughs> I'm teaching these kids for like no, not kid, no kids but I'm teaching these people to do what I love without ever getting to do it myself and they were long weeks 70, 80 hour weeks sometimes you go to bed at 2 in the morning after a long physical day you got to be up at 6 again to do you know another 12, 14 hour day and I'm doing it all on the prosthetics 
trying to hide the pain that I'm in while also expending, you know, they say you burn 80% more energy on a prosthetic leg than just someone else walking. So I am just shattered, you know, I'm drinking more, I'm not becoming a nice person, I'm not, I'm not nice to the trainees. And that's sort of a thing that goes along with it. Like you've seen SEAL training and stuff like that. So you're not really that nice to them. You, you're hurting them and you're pushing them to their limits. So I didn't like the person I was becoming. I wasn't sleeping and, and all that stuff. And so I was just like, I need to find a way out of this. Um, and I'd had companies asking me to speak. But like I said earlier, um, my biggest fears were sharks and public speaking. And so I'm like, I am not doing that. There is nothing that I have been through that is worth, like, how, what message do I have? Like, I don't, never felt like I did anything special. I just didn't die, and then I went back to work. So um, companies have been asking me, because it was huge news all across Australia, you know, the first clearance diver ever attacked by a shark, the first shark attack in Sydney Harbour in 50 years. So everyone knew the story, and, um, but it, then I had Canteen. It's a cancer camp for kids asked me to go and talk at one of their camps. I was like, damn it. I can't say no to kids with cancer. <laughs> like, ah. Oh. So I agreed and I was walking into that room and my whole body was shaking. I'm like, dude, you play with bombs. You jump out of planes. You're scared of 20 children. Get your shit together. And I went in there and I gave this little presentation and had some laughs, answered some questions. And I walked out of there on top of the world. You know, I, I got to share a story with these kids and some of them have grown up in hospital. Some of them were not going to reach their 15, 15 year old birthdays. There was a kid in there that he was 19. He had meningococcal. He went to sleep one night, woke up two months later with no hands and no feet. You know, that kid hasn't even lived. And I'm in there scared of like inspiring and trying to like give these kids a laugh. I'm like, no. Nah. Like I walked out of there, I'm like, I made those kids have a good time, forget that they were sick. And I was like, I, I could do this. And so I started trying that out a little more and the, the Navy wouldn't give me leave to do it. I had to take my sick days and stuff. And eventually I just ran out of sick days. I'm like, I'm at a crux here. Like, what do I do? Do I leave the security of the guaranteed paycheck of my work that I actually don't enjoy anymore? Or do I leave that security blanket and strike out on my own or something I've never done before and I'm scared of? So, I'm, but I've learned over the years, those really big, scary decisions, they're the ones that you have to take the most because they're the ones that push you into becoming the person that you truly are. Like you're never going to become who you are, who you're supposed to be by taking the easy route every time. Sometimes you've got to challenge yourself and face those fears because that is who you're supposed to be. It's, it's a, the path is set, the challenge is set for you. Like they're not hurdles. These are opportunities for you to become that person. And so I'm like, all right, I got to do that. Left the Navy, started striking out on my own, doing speaking and stuff, and started making my two weeks Navy wage in one hour. And it was like, hell yeah. And then I start, the first year I was speaking, I would know what I said for the first sentence and I would know how I was going to close it. And I would get off stage and I would sit down and I would think, I have no idea what the fuck I just said. <laughs> but they clapped. So I think it was okay. And then eventually over time, you get comfortable with it and I learned to read the audience, feel their energies. And I know, you learn how to take them through this emotional roller coaster with like lessons embedded into it. And now it's one of my greatest joys to be on stage, like sharing with these people and you know, giving them some perspective and introspect and lighting a fire in their lives so that you know they can go out and feel buoyed and energetic like they can achieve anything man I, I love that feeling i mean i feel like you're the ultimate public speaker because you are a badass you had a badass <laughs> job you had the craziest thing happen that a lot of people are scared of i'm just so curious where you find the motivation to keep bettering yourself because that seems more instinctual than anything that happened to you um I think it's because I'm not dead. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to die. Like, there was never any thought of suicide. Like, there was a period after my leg got chopped off um, where I went through absolute agonizing pain for 20 hours. No drugs could stop it. I was laying in my hospital bed for 20 hours, rolling from side to side, begging to die, just in tears. You know, you can do one hour, two hours, but with no end in sight, 15, 20 hours... All I wanted to do was die. I, I wished that the shark had killed me. Other than that period of time, it's never been a concern. Even when I was a kid and I wanted to, I hated life. I would slash up my arms. I was a self-harmer. 
I, I was never going to kill myself. I just needed to let that pain out. And so if I'm going to be alive, I'm not going to be that person that I was before because I lived that life already pointless, no value, living in a cloud and fog of painkillers and drugs. I will never be that person again because it's so empty and hollow. So it doesn't feel like I'm trying to better myself. It just feels like I'm living. And now that I've actually faced death and I know that death isn't scary, but going to your deathbed with missed opportunities and regrets and things that you wished you accomplished but never did, that's fear. That's what people need to fear. But if you live the life on your own terms and do everything that you dream of doing, whether or not you achieve it or not, like as long as you try and get there, that's not a failure. A failure is never trying. But if you've tried and you've lived your life, then you will go to your deathbed with no regrets. Like, okay, I lived. That was enough. And so that's just how I want to live now. Like knowing that next time I go to my deathbed, I have no regrets, no missed opportunities. Like I've done it. You know? So it's just, it's living. It's not, it's not bettering myself. It is trying to learn, to teach and to be of service. That's so inspirational. It's, it's just life, man. They're like, that's, that's what life's about. Learn. We always want to keep learning. We want to teach people about the things that we've learned how to overcome and be of service. Right? That's the most important things. You mentioned on other podcasts too that you spent time with the wrong crowd. Was joining the military your way of escaping that? Um, you know what? I don't think they were the wrong crowd. Like I have said that in the past. They were my friends. We just took the wrong paths together. Yeah, it, was, it wasn't the wrong crowd. There were periods where there were unhealthy people in my life. Um, and, you know, they're the cool people, the people with the drugs and all that sort of stuff. And you kind of gravitate towards that when you've never been cool your whole life and you kind of want to fit in. Um, but eventually it was just me and my mates that I'd grown up with and we just chose the wrong paths together. Like we chose the exciting path. We didn't have any money, so we'd just go and steal booze and then we'd get drunk and we'd fight. You know, we didn't have any money, so we'd go to the store and we'd steal, you know. I mean, so, yeah, that, that, that's not true. Like sometimes you say things um, that you believe in that moment, but then over time you, you, your perception of things change. And so it's kind of like when you see all these celebrities and stuff and things get brought up about their past, uh, past and they get judged very harshly for that. But they're not the same people they were as they are now. Like we grow and our ideas change and who we are as people change. And so you can't really judge people on their past. And so now I would never blame anyone else for the path I chose. That was my path. And I eventually chose a very dangerous life. Yeah. And so I don't even blame the shark. Like I've never held any animosity towards that shark because I chose a life where I was doing so many dangerous things and I loved it. And so you can't choose a dangerous path and then get upset when something goes wrong. It could have been a motorcycle accident. It could have been a bullet, a bomb. It could have been any number of things. At least this way, I got a cool story. Uh, that's about it. But, but I, got this, <laughs> I got this great new life, man. Like eventually I fell into uh, doing Shark Week and TV. I became comfortable in front of the camera from doing interviews and things like that. And Discovery Channel saw that and offered me a job. And now I get to live in America. I get to travel the world, have adventures, speak like I was just talking about. And that's it. Even after you were bitten, you weren't angry at the shark at all? No, not, not the shark. I'm still very cautious of bull sharks when I'm in the water with them. Oh, you're not scared of them? Because a lot, I feel like the Shark Week specials you do are, let's put Paul back in with the bull shark. Yeah, a lot of them are. Yeah, <laughs> That's like, just the idea. All right, we're going to get Paul to teach Ronda Rousey how to hand feed bull sharks in <laughs> Fiji. Didn't you swim in your own pool of blood to see if bull sharks like you? Yeah, tiger sharks, hammers oh, tiger and bulls. Yeah, I drained a liter of my own blood out on the back of the boat. And then, so it was a show called Laws of Jaws. So we're trying to break down myths about sharks. And so I jumped off the back of the boat in the Bahamas, surrounded by sharks and ripped open a bag of my own blood. And it was like all around me. And the sharks didn't do anything. But then they threw a bucket of fish blood into the water and I had to swim through that. And I was like, oh, pushing sharks away. Shit, <laughs> shit. <laughs> Get out of the butt, the water at lightning speed. Yeah, yeah it's yeah, it's. Sometimes I forget the stupid things I've done. <laughs> so yeah. you do a lot of Shark Week specials. Are there, Do you ever feel like you're in a situation where things could escalate really quickly and you feel like you have to get out of there? Not to the point where I have to get out. There was one show that I just did. Uh, 
it didn't it was supposed to come out this season in July but um, they pushed it to next year for some reason really good show we went out to the Solomon Islands which is a chain of like 900 islands hundreds of miles off the coast of Australia this is like as far from civilization as you can get like jungle um, so we went out there to conduct the first uh, shark survey to see what sharks lived in the area how many of them there were in this really desolated place uh, the Chinese are out there like destroying the ecosystem killing all the fish in the reef so we wanted to see what was out there and I did jump in the water at one point we're on this thing called a, a fad a fish aggregation device that the fishermen use to attract fish we went out there to see what was living on it and I jumped in the water first before everyone else and the water in the Solomon Islands is bathtub warm so I'm just in a pair of shorts and uh, I jump in the water and there's these sharks called silky sharks they're only small they're probably five maybe six foot they've never seen humans before they don't know what I am they don't know to be scared of me and they there's this photo I have where I'm in the water with my GoPro on a stick like this and there's seven silky sharks like this lined up in front of me like a school of piranhas like <laughs> dinner <laughs> they start coming at me from every angle bumping me one of them grabbed my fins and I just whoop out of the water I'm like I'm waiting for you two guys. I have my cameraman and the shark scientist with me. I'm like, strength in numbers. I'm not going back in there until you guys are ready. Um, and so we did get in there. And even the, the cameraman and the scientist was like, these sharks are crazy. So we went down a little bit deeper, calmed down and tried to like do the survey and count and all that sort of stuff. But yeah, unexpectedly, the small sharks are the ones that I got afraid of enough to get out of the water. Could, but then we got back in. Could that have turned into a frenzy? Yeah, absolutely. That, that's a, why it's so dangerous. What's Be a feeding frenzy? Uh, so basically when sharks feed, there's prey in the water, even you. if it's just one shark in the water and it goes into a feeding mode, it will grab something, it will thrash and that will create motion and vibrations and frequency in the water to tell the other sharks that there's food in the water. So they all just swarm and get anything they can that they can feed on. So that's a feeding frenzy. Can sharks really smell blood from a mile away? Uh, they can smell not like it depends on the blood. You know, um, most sharks don't eat mammals. Uh, great whites eat mammals. Um, tiger sharks have been known to as well. Uh, but most sharks eat fish, ray, so their, their senses are tuned into that sort of pH level, that fat smell. You know, that, that a large part of their brain is the olfactory system, so the, the scent system. So they can smell like blood and also you know that's such a complex system they have uh they can feel frequency and vibrations all down the lines of their body all through their nose uh and also all over their body so they feel a combination of things but that scent you know they you see how they swim like that it's not just because the tails make them do that so each nasal passage is individually operated so they swim smell the blood they know that on the tra right track if they come out and the other nose doesn't smell blood they zero back in and so they just hone in on that smell yeah, they, they can come a long way, but that vibration and everything, the electromagnetic signatures they have, yeah, it's wild. Being attacked by one, can you see why they've survived for so long and they're the number one killing machine in the ocean? Not even killing machine. I don't want to say on. that. <laughs> I take that back. I take that back. <laughs> can you see why they're, they're just like the biggest predators in the ocean? Yeah, yeah. They've lived over 500 million years. Oh, they're older than trees apparently that's what scientists say i don't know how they know that but yeah. that's what they say uh, and the sad thing is that the only thing that's going to wipe them out is us you know you've got places down in gulf of mexico and off like north carolina where the fishermen are like they're saying they can't pull in fish because there's so many sharks out there that, you know they're swarming they're shark infested and they they hate it they want to go and kill all the sharks but they, these are really rare things like most of the world the shark populations have been decimated by commercial fishing mostly is it over 90 percent yeah that's that's what the scientists say like, that's a lot all i can say is like what i've read what the scientists say what they tell me because you know i'm not a scientist they they call me an expert all the time i'm not i would never take that title away from the real shark experts i might be an expert at diving with sharks uh reading them but yeah that's what they say 70 to 90 percent of all shark species have been wiped out just in the last 50 years you know, since we've got these super trawlers roaming all around the planet like sucking up a football field's worth of fish in one go and you know they've got holds that they can do multiple then they have ships that come out take that 
fish and everything off away and then they just refill like during covid people were saying oh this is gonna be great for the oceans no one can go out fishing there was a fleet of over 300 chinese fishing boats between ecuador and the galapagos islands which is like a, you know one of the most world's most ecologically important places diverse uh, animals and they went out there for three months and wiped out everything they found and so these illegal and commercial fishing vessels are just destroying the ocean and uh, there's a point, a fulcrum where, you know, you hit a limit where they just can't rebound from and then it's, then it's gone. So it, that's why I, I feel like what we do is pretty important. And all of the shark conservation groups, um, like shark allies, they go in and they try and change the legislation to shark fishing and things like that. Stopping shark finning. It's so important because if we don't have the sharks in there. People don't seem to understand uh, the ripple effect that happens when you remove an apex predator so if you take sharks out of the equation as that apex predator the food that they eat doesn't have a predator so their populations explode and that might be carnivorous fish those carnivorous fish that eat other fish their population grows unchecked they devour all the other fish and those fish that they're eating herbivorous fish they're the fish that eat the algae off the reefs and if you don't have those fish to eat that algae, the algae grows and suffocates the whole reef. Then you've wiped out an entire ecosystem. So that's why the sharks are so important. They eat the old, they eat the dying, they keep populations in check. So it's really important when you go out and you see, I've seen some of these reefs that are just totally crushed. They're dead because the fishermen have come in, remove the sharks, remove the fish, and there's not enough life there to support the ecosystem. Yeah, it's really sad. Like the, the even the Great Barrier Reef, you know, they allow fishing in there. This is one of the world's marvels, and yet they let uh, fi giant oil rigs and drilling and fishing in this ecological marvel in Australia. If they're doing it in Australia, where like this is an amazing thing, hundreds of millions of dollars of tourist money coming into where you want that thing alive. What are the other countries doing that are unchecked? Like China is destroying everything in their path like it's so sad so i just hope and pray that we get to a point where you know, we understand and we start trying to reel in the destruction like i got to i can't i don't eat seafood anymore i can't be a part of that like i i hate it when i like you see these people going out fishing and they're so happy with the fish they're caught and why can't you just get in the water and see it why do you have to kill it like a lot of people kill sharks for sport they have sport shark sport fishing tournaments and the sharks are just thrown in the bin at the end i'm like why don't you just go dive with them see them as the amazing animal they are take some photos you don't need to kill everything to have fun yeah so anyway i'm pretty passionate about that because when i get in the water and i don't see life that makes me sad what is the purpose of finning are they eating the fins yeah yeah so uh 2009, I went to the UN with the, the Pew International Trust and we, we were petitioning the UN to try and ban uh, shark finning in America and other countries if we could. So the practice of shark finning is specifically where they go catch the sharks, chop the fins off, and then they throw the shark back into the water. The whole body. The whole body. What and they're, they're still alive. Whoa. Yeah, and so... And they can't survive from that. They can't survive. You can't swim. They can't breathe. They've got no fins. Like, they just die. And so trying to take it piece by piece, you, we couldn't outlaw shark finning, but we were trying to ban the practice of throwing the shark's body back into the ocean. So they can't just keep piling up the fins. You know, you can fit far more, more fins in a refrigerated hold than you can if the sharks are still attached to them. So we're trying to make it so that, and, and it worked. Like you are now not allowed to fin a shark unless you bring the whole shark back to shore. So they can't take as many. I would like to see a point where you can't, fin a shark at all like you know you, there, there are certain sharks you can't kill in florida it's terrible you can actually kill a tiger shark every single day of the week if you want hammerheads like great hammerheads have never harmed a human being one a day you can, yeah you can kill one a day if you have multiple people on your boat I, like I, i'd have to look up the rules i think you can take one per person yeah in many parts of america uh and these animals are really slow to reproduce and so they're just not giving these animals time to reproduce. So, um, yeah, like we'll go out to the Bahamas and we'll film and there's been like resident sharks out there. We know them by name, you know, that they've been there for years and then all of a sudden they don't turn up for a couple of years and you're like, you start to get scared. Like they've, they've been killed. You and know the sharks by 
Yeah. You, you yeah. have relationships with the sharks? Me personally, I don't go out there enough to. I know the sharks by name, which ones they are. Um, That's crazy. A couple of them, yeah. They're, they're, they're so sweet. They, they come in and they're quite gentle most of the time. There's a few that are like one of the guys in our last dive. There's a, um, a shark, a hammerhead shark called, called Buttface. <laughs> but she, she, something happened to her she got hit with a propeller something she's got a big ding in her face some people call it uh, uh, jitterbug uh, I took uh, Will Smith out there and we me and Will Smith were like swimming with her and he renamed her Angelina he, he was like you can't call a woman butt face and so yeah but she you gotta watch her you know one of our divers on the last dive uh, redirected her and with tiger sharks you don't wanna you know we call it redirect and you put your hand on the head redirect them into another direction. Yeah, you taught us that on our Shark Week yeah. episode, which yeah. I was so mind blown at. <laughs> uh, but you don't turn your back on the tiger sharks because they'll literally just turn and come back. Hey, you got to watch them, even though there's another shark over here. And one of the guys, we were watching him, the shark turned and bit. And we were like... <gasps> Did he have a he, he metal suit it. on? Uh, no, no. Oh. So he turned, pushed it away. We were waiting for the blood. And we, we got back upstairs uh, on the boat. And it was like, he's got holes in his buoyancy compensator in the, the vest. And we're like, oh my God, dude, you're so lucky. So it's like, like we know them. They're great sharks. We swim with them a lot. But they're also a wild animal. So you have to give them respect. You have to know exactly what you're doing. So it's like this fine balance, you know. You, you, people say, oh, I like puppies. No, ooh, the puppy's not going to bite your head off. Yeah. But yeah, it, have, it's pretty cool. Have you ever swam with orcas? That's, that's what I want to do it so bad. You want to? I want to do it so bad, bro. They're, have you have you ever seen how big an orca is? Like yeah. it's mind blowing. Like yeah, they, they've never a wild orca. I don't think has ever harmed a human. There's two kinds: ones that only eat fish, and ones that only eat mammals. Right? Um, I think they're opportunistic feeders, um, so they'll take whatever they can get but they'll literally like catch a stingray and they just play with it yeah. like they, they, they kill for fun uh you watch some of these documentaries like blue planet and this is how smart they are you know they've got a a seal or a sea lion on an ice patch and they'll line up together just under the surface to create this bow wave underneath them and that will hit the ice and flick the seal off so they can eat it like that is smart and like, you want to go in there with them oh yeah yeah absolutely <laughs> i would love to um they're, they're always like mostly in cold water. I don't know. I don't know if they actually run trips where you can do it, but yeah, I'd do it. I'd love to. I, don't, I would feel moderately safe. Like you never know until you try. Are Greenland sharks dangerous? Because they live, some of them live up to 500 years. Yeah, sharks, all sharks can be dangerous. Even the ones that, you know, you see that are calm and chill. They're like, any wild animal can be dangerous. Uh, Greenland sharks have been found with reindeers in their stomachs, polar bears in their stomachs. They're massive. Polar bears? Yeah, but they're the, the oldest living vertebrate in the world. Like, as you said, the, the scientists have said that uh, judging by, um, oh, I can't remember what it is, something in, to do with their eyes. Uh, they measured some sort of time period, carbon dated their eyes or something. But yeah, 500 years. Like, you Imagine they've lived through all the world wars, and that just blows my mind. That they live in the ice, the yeah. huge, big submarines, and they're blind. Yeah, they just—I don't know how they feed blind. That's how special their senses are. They can survive five hundred years, not even be able to see. Yeah, you did a reenactment at the same spot where you were attacked. Yeah, was that a mind fuck? <laughs> Uh, not really. That was the, I think that was the first interview that I ever did with Shark Week. Um, and so would, I think it was a show called I Survived Jaws. And so they were interviewing people that had been through shark attacks. And that day we were at the spot and I think someone was supposed to turn up to do the reenactment, but he didn't come. And so I'm like, oh, I'll do it. And they're like, what? I'm like, yeah, that's all right. Don't worry about it. Um, I know there's a bit of a bravado there. I'm like, I have something to prove. Yeah, I'm not scared anymore. Um, and so I, I got in the water with the camera guy and we're trying to do the reenactment. He's coming up from underneath me with the camera and he's hitting me in the leg. And I'm like, oh, God, it felt exactly the same. And so we're in there for about 20 minutes and he's going, we'll just do another couple of these. And I, I said to him, oh, you know this is exactly where I got attacked and we're doing exactly what I did when I got attacked and we've been here for a while. And he looks at me and goes, yeah, you're all right, we're done. And we, we got out of the water. <laughs> so yeah, I, 
I did have to go back into the harbour. Um, the first time was when I was actually working with the Navy Reserve when I, I got out of full-time service. And we had to retrieve a, a massive anchor that was stuck in the mud in Darling Harbour in Sydney after a big boat show. It was right next to an old display uh, submarine. And so uh, we did our briefings. We went up to Maritime and he's telling us about, you know, what we need to do, where the, the, the anchor is laying. And he goes, we're about to walk away. And he goes, oh, just so you know, a few of the guys were down on the dock the other day and they saw a really big bull shark down there. And I was like, don't worry about it. We're good. Walked away and I was next to my chief and I, God, I wish he didn't say that. <laughs> so, and I'm like, I, I got to be the first one in the water. And my chief knows me real well. I worked with him for a long time. He's like, yeah, no worries, DG. And we got in, in the boat. We're preparing I got all my dive suit on, just about to get in the water. And chief gets a phone call and he goes, ah, yeah, all right. And he goes, something with the paperwork's not right. Like dive's canceled. And I looked at him and I was like, it's like my first dive in the harbor. Like first dive back properly operational with the Navy. I'm like, chief, I got to do this. He's like, off you go. So I get in the water and I go down. I'm following this little line that's been tied off to the top of the anchor. And I get down to the bottom. I'm going head first. And I've like, got my, my weightlifting arm on with a steel hook on the end. So I was sort of like got the line going through that. I'm like, okay, got to go slow. I'm going to hit. The bottom of Sydney Harbour is silt. And so once you hit it, it just plumes. You can't see anything. And it's really soft. And so I get down there and the line... I, the anchor's not there. The anchor's still under the silt. And so I'm just following the line in uh, with my hand like that. I'm getting deeper and deeper and deeper in the silt. And it gets up to my neck and I feel the top of the anchor. I'm like, okay, now I need to find out which way it's... Sorry, now i got to find out which way it's laying so we know which way to do the pull so it won't get stuck suctioned in the mud. So i got to go down the neck of the anchor trying to designate which way it's laying. I get up to my neck and I'm like, okay, I, I think I know I can't go any deeper. Like my, my reg's about to get pushed out of my mouth by the mud. I'm like, but I've got my weightlifting arm on. I'm like, how am I going to push myself out? So I slide it in. I, both my arms are in the mud. And I'm like, and I think this would be a, a really bad time for a shark to turn up. Oh my I'm God. like upside down, up to mud in my neck. I'm like, oh, what do I do? I'm like, like that, that panic starts to set in. But you have to push that away, like calm, breathe, think about the situation. What are you going to do? Problem solve. I'm like, okay, I'm just like inching my, my hand up like that, just like half an inch at a time, trying to push my arms out of the mud. And I'd finally, like eventually get up. And I'm in the water way longer than I should be. I'm sure everyone's on the surface like, what the hell is going on? Is he all right? Get to the surface, mud up to my neck like this and all over my chest all over the side of my head and I pull myself out in the boat and Chief goes oh good DG like, no worries Chief and off we go that was my first dive back yeah thinking about ooh I wonder if a shark came like they're always on my mind man but it's like okay over the years now you know the, the most excitement um, there's a lot of excitement when you're in the water with the sharks, but it's kind of like when the most excitement is when you're standing on the back of that boat and you're about to just step into the water, into the, an unknown scenario. What's going to happen? That, that's exciting. And it used to strike a little fear in my heart. My heart would flutter. You know, you get your stomach going weird, like, I don't know. But then I turn, I've learned to turn that into a, an excitement. And it's not to be a feared. You know, it's, I know I've done this before. I know I know what to do if things turn sour. And I've learned, I'm like, this is going to be awesome. Yeah. And that's, that's what you can do with fear. You know, okay, okay, I'm a little scared, but this is excitement. Yeah. This is because, like, this is worth doing. That's why I'm scared. So then I get in and everything washes away. And every time I have the best time. That's so badass how you've turned it into such a positive thing. Yeah, it's, it took time. Yeah. But it's, you know, everyone can do it. Like, I'm nothing special. Uh, like I said, I, I don't think I've done anything special. You, you heard who I was when I was a kid and into my 20s even. I was like not good at a lot and I was struggling at life, uh, trying to find my path, my purpose, my value. And now it's like, oh, I'm, now I know how to do that. And I'm older, I'm a little, little wiser, a little bit, not much. Uh, but yeah, I, I get to live, you know, and I think I feel bad for people that don't. I get it. It's never too late. If you're not where you want to be in life, don't accept that. 
don't just don't just exist like find a way to live find those things that you really love focus on them you know embrace them into your life like i've i've traveled to places third world countries i've seen people and cultures that exist and live with nothing you know people that you know they're sweeping the leaves off the dirt floor of their huts you know huts they've built themselves they collecting water from the tap in the main street the whole village has to do it and yet they're happy you know they're so happy they got their family they got their safety they got you know some, a lot of times their religion they're off to church and dressed up in you know their finest clothes uh and they're happy and then you come back to a place like Australia and America and you run into so many people that don't have any happiness. They have no joy. They've just lost the ability to find happiness in things. And I think it's because they're, they're not living. They, they haven't seen you know, how little we need to be happy. You know, go back to being a kid. You, know, you remember what it was like, like the first time you've experienced something, you like a balloon. And a balloon is like the best thing you've ever seen. Like never become numb to that. Like find joy in the little things and surround yourself in all of that stuff. Then you don't have a reason to be sad and share that. So many people are, you know, you go to work or you have this person, you know, and you see them. And as soon as you see them, you're like, they, they bring your happiness down. You know, people say your vibration, they bring your frequency down. And like, oh, it's like, oh, I know what's going to happen. But you also know the, the other side of that coin. You know the people that you see, your best mates, and it's like hugs, and, like, and they tell you fun, funny story or whatever. You go out and you, you do something fun together. Like, be the light you want to see in other people. Like, be that person. Even if you've got to like force it a little bit, like everything in life to get better at is practice. Like my diving's practice, my shark interaction's practice, my parachuting, everything. Like your podcasting, I'm sure you're better at it now than you were when you first started. Like everything, our emotions are no different. Like we are in control of this and this. So the, the more you practice something, the easier it is to call on that skill, whether that be riding a scooter or swimming or calling on your happiness and calling on your joy and calling on your motivation, you know, that sort of thing. Practice it. You know, surround yourself in all the things you love. Practice the things that you truly value. And then when times get tough, it's easier to call on those things to make you feel a little bit better. You know your triggers, you know what makes you happy, whether that's going down to the beach to the sand and just sitting there and listening to the ocean, like getting out into nature is one of the best things. Go to the forest, go to the park, walk your dog, do something like that. Get the fuck out of your own head, away from the concrete and bullshit, take your shoes off and go and be in nature. Like, it, like nothing is better to me than being totally submerged in the ocean. That shit just washes everything away. It makes me feel so good. I'm like one with nature. It's beautiful. I'm being encompassed by the natural world. Like for me, you're like know your triggers. Know what makes you happy. Know what makes you sad. Know what fills you with anger and depression and stay away from that shit. Like you don't need to include it in your life, whether that be people or things that you do. Like it's your choice. Yeah, it's so true. You shared a lot of that stuff too in your book. Yeah, yeah. Mostly this one. The shark one goes into some of the detail, but you're educating more about the sharks in general in this one. Yeah. Um, what was in Uncaged? Because I haven't had the chance to read that one yet. Yeah, that's um, that's basically the story. That's you know the, all the the stuff, the my embarrassing stories, uh, like having to find my shit in the bush when I first joined the army, and my it was pitch black at night, and my instructor like. I couldn't find the path in the bush at night and I really needed to shit. Like I'm lactose intolerant and say 50% of the ration packs are like dairy. Oh, no. And so I like smashed a bag of M&Ms and some or whatever and I'm like, oh, I gotta go. And it's <laughs> pitch black in the forest. And like, this is probably my first month in the army and I get lost out in the bush where it's white light is banned. So I can't like use a torch or a match or anything like that. And I'm like, what? And I just drop it and go. And then I have to... F my, my instructor was actually watching me and he pff, light on me. He's like, what are you doing? Why, why aren't you shitting at the shit pit? I'm like, I couldn't find it. And he's like, well, I don't want anyone else stepping in it. So you find it. I'm like, <laughs> I don't know where it is. And so <laughs> I had to get on my hands and knees and search for my own shit by smell to try and find it. So like all the, the 
embarrassing stories, all the excitement stories, all the stuff about the shark attack and all the like cool stuff from Shark Week as well. It's like a, a journey, but I tried to like put some life lessons in there as well. So it'll be valuable, but entertaining. Yeah. And then is that what made you want to write a kid's book that a lot of your stories could translate for kids to grow up and really just shape their future? Yeah. The, the kids book, um, and this is just the first one of a series I'm starting. I wanted to, you know, we all go through a lot of shit when we're kids whether that be bullying, making friends, being different. Uh, so I wanted to like, adults are so, it's so hard to impress these days. Like no matter what you do, there's always gonna be haters talking shit about you. And I feel like the best way is to reach the kids. You know, they're not corrupted yet. And so I wanted to write uh, a series of kids books about social issues that would be entertaining. So I did this story about, you know, amputation, which is something near and dear to my heart. So I did a story about Big Red Bruce, the kangaroo who lost his tail. Uh, and he's like a champion jumper in the Outback Olympics. And he um, gets stuck in a storm and his tail gets chopped off and his friends come to his aid and they go out and try and solve the problem and be good mates and eventually build him a prosthetic tail and he goes back to the the outback and re-wins the bush olympics and everyone loves his new prosthetic tail even though it's made of bush leaves and you know so it, the illustrations are beautiful yeah thank you uh yeah so it's just it was a little something like i said i, I want to be of service so it makes me feel like I'm doing something worthwhile. And if, you know, I've had messages about that book where teachers have bought it and read it to their, their kids and they just loved it and they're so happy and she's just, they're all just waiting for the next one. So and the next one I want to do is about making friends and being different. It's a, an echidna and a, a quokka, which no one knows what a quokka is. What's that? So quokka's like, they say it's the happiest looking animal in the world. Uh, little furry? Little furry thing. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. Chris Hemsworth did a photo with it. Yeah. yeah. And so they exist um, on the west coast of Australia and they're, adorable little fluffy things and they're so happy and the echidnas are like a porcupine but smaller really spiky so i'm doing this story where you know neither of them can make friends because they're too different and then they come together and everyone else sees how happy they are and how much fun they're having and then they want to be happy as well so it's anyway you know, i want to do that whole series and just you know give something to the kids that's awesome when's that expected to come out uh probably not too long within the next two months oh well yeah cool. so i i like to hire um, people to help me with this, like illustrators and stuff, so I can support other people. So I get onto Fiverr, I find people in other countries like Indonesia or Africa or something like that where they can you know, really use the money and hire them to do it. Uh, it was hard with this kid in Indonesia because I don't know how, but I feel like he didn't know how to use Google. Uh, and so I'd give him the instructions for one page at a time and the picture would come back and I'm like, that's not a kangaroo. Uh, I don't know what that animal is. He, he put a lion in the background of one. I was like, I didn't ask for a lion. There's no lions in Australia. And so I had to like send him pictures of every animal and break it down into tiny, minute instructions. And he came back with that. It's beautiful. Yeah, it's amazing. That's awesome. Cool. Well, Shark Week special coming out next week, uh, next year. Next year, yeah. I got three three new ones. Uh, diving in the Solomons. I was free diving with sharks on an active underwater volcano while it was erupting. What island or where? Uh, it's all the Solomon Islands. Oh. It's that place I was talking about before where the, the silky sharks were like looking at me like piranhas. Yeah. That same one. So that was wild. We're like out in the wilds of the jungles of the South Pacific. We were staying on an island where seven people had been killed by crocodiles in the last two years. So we're out there diving, finding sharks, documenting them and volcano no one had been to the volcano no the fishermen won't go there because it's too dangerous so we park our boat like 300 feet away from this erupting volcano i'm in the water breath hold diving down filming sharks with my gopro and then it erupts and it's like i've been in the water with bombs going off this was way louder it was like the loudest thunder clap i've ever heard but i felt it inside my head and then the pressure wave hits you and goes through your whole body and it forced all the air out of my lungs i'm like on one breath it's 60 feet down I'm like oh shit back to the service so that yeah that show is coming out are they um, filming you throughout all that yeah 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 it was all filmed you need your own series oh dude i would love that, that why that was, is discovery sleeping on you that was one of the the goals of coming out here and i nearly had it i had a show uh xbox was gonna was gonna do original programming in like 2014 and we pitched a show called fearless where i was gonna go and embed with groups of people risking their lives to make the world a better place or to save people and so it's gonna be like bomb disposal guys the fire jumpers and i, I pitched the 
the pilot where we would go to Africa and I would train and embed with an anti-poaching unit. So we went out to Zimbabwe and I worked with a friend of mine, Damien Mander. Um, he was in the Game Changers towards the end. And uh, I embedded with him, learned how to hunt, and they, they wanted me to experience all the things that the rangers would. So they took me to the range to shoot the weapons that the poachers use uh, and the anti-poaching rangers have to face. And then they, they gave me a five-minute lesson on how to handle a snake. And then they gave me a deadly black mamba. You uh, had to handle a deadly black mamba? Yeah, yeah. And it, there's a whole story that? behind that, but uh, I think I put it in the book. But it's like, yeah, that was super dangerous. I couldn't control the snake because of my robot hand. Is, it, was, it was wild. Um, so that was the series. And it went really well, but then Xbox decided not to do a um, uh, TV anymore. Were you able to grab the mamba? Yeah, yeah, I picked it up. I had it in my hands. And then you... Oh. Yeah, so this is like... I won't go into it because I need to like get up and do the movements. It's yeah, like, yeah. It's only funny with the movements. I got to do this wild, crazy black mama snake dance to keep it away from biting my face. Uh, everyone's screaming at me to drop it, not knowing that I couldn't drop it because I'd held the snake pole with this hand and I turned it off so I didn't accidentally drop the pole. So I couldn't release the pole or the snake. And it was like coming up the pole towards my face. And so it was wild so i almost had my own series and that was kind of like the reason i came out here like i love doing tv i love teaching people about the world and cultures and, uh, and the other amazing people that you know they're doing incredible things in the world they might be risking their lives to make the world a better place and yet they get no recognition for it they get little support they've got to fight for all their funding like the anti-poaching units that are trying to save the animals in in africa so i wanted to expose them and share their stories so that they might get more support from people but uh, it ended up not going through. Um, and so now it's kind of like, I still want to do something like that, but it's kind of been put on the back burner because it's been so many years. No one seems to be that interested. Like reality TV has taken over, um, but I love what I do, man. And I'd love to have my own series doing that sort of stuff. But also I fell into acting. And acting, I don't have to risk my life every time I'm, I'm shooting. So it's kind of like <laughs> I did this uh, mini series in Australia. I did a short film out here um, for a friend of mine. And I love, like, it's so much fun. It's so much easier. Like, I've just got to learn words and then pretend to be someone else. But I also have to, like, put on an American accent as well, which is not easy. I go real Southern because it's kind of like the, the, the accent that stands out the most. Uh, anyway, I, I love doing that. So I'm like, I'm trying to move into that a little bit. There's not a lot of roles for double amputee robot people though. Yeah, I'm yeah. sure there are. I feel uh, like there are. I'm, I'm going to keep looking. Especially, if, anyone, if anyone has one, I'm happy to jump in. How much mobility do you have in your hand? Uh, I can open it and close it with that one grip and then I can change the grip to, oh, keeps changing, to beer drinking grip. Beer drinking but, yeah. <laughs> Or man grip. Like this is a grip I shake men's hands with because it's firm and it's wide and this other one is the neutral grip but also girl girl grip so i shake it's not as hard it won't crush a girl's hand uh, so it, like this is the best robotic hand in the world is that uh, your weightlifting one you said no this is a ninety thousand dollar hand so i don't i damage it enough already without lifting weights with it i've got a, a weightlifting arm that's similar it's carbon fiber but it has different attachments on the end so I was, like, there's a clamp, I can clamp dumbbells in and there's a hook that I dive with, but also, you know, I'm doing pulling and chin up exercises with, uh, I've got one for kayaking. I've got one for punching the heavy bag. I've got, this is my walking leg. Also the best prosthetic in the world. It's about, worth about 200 grand. Uh, it's waterproof so I can swim with it, but I can't dive with it because it's got electronics in it. And so you can't like the pressure of going too deep would break the seals and flood the electronics. So I changed to my diving leg. I've got two different diving legs. Uh, I've got two snowboarding legs. I love snowboarding. Um, uh, I parachute. I've got my own parachute and I've uh, skydive with my weightlifting arm with the hook. Running blade. Dude, my, my bags get heavy when I travel. Like I have to decide what it is that I'm doing when I go away. Right, I'm either diving or I'm running. I'm not doing both because the bags get too heavy. Yeah. Do you have... Um for when you're doing weightlifting stuff, mm. are you able to do bench press and you're Dude, doing was, curls and I everything? I was doing incline dumbbell press with 110 pound dumbbells today. Oh my God. Yeah. So I like, they're good. They're sturdy. Like, are, your, it's, are your right arm and left arm pretty balanced as yeah, far as how yeah, much you curl? Yeah, they're pretty good. Yeah. That's great. Um, the weightlifting arm's a little bit longer and so the lever's longer. So the weight's out further. So it's a little heavier. So if I'm doing like curls, I'll probably do like a, a 30 and a 35. 
but other than that like yeah no i have no problems like 20 chin-ups like heavy like weighted chin-ups heavy bench press and stuff yeah are you more jacked up now than you were before the attack i, I am uh because i don't do as much cardio uh, uh, like in the in the military you got a cardio all the time so i found it really hard to put on weight and i used to be a big runner you know I'd, i ran races for the navy uh 100 mile races up and down mountains in tasmania and i didn't even need to train for it like i've done I'd, half marathons hey congratulations good <laughs> Baby hey, runs man. compared to you no no it's 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 an accomplishment <laughs> like running's not easy like i just i grew up a swimmer like my dad was a swimming coach so i couldn't get out of it and so i had that cardiovascular uh, when i was younger and smoking a pack a day before i joined the army not so good the bongs not really uh <laughs> the bong's not really great for running uh but i you know once i joined the military i got super fit like i could hunt the the pt test part of it was how many push-ups can you do in two minutes i could do 132 push-ups in two minutes like just straight so i could like fit as hell but now like running on the blade it's not comfortable uh, I can only really run about 5Ks uh, on it before it just becomes too painful. And so it's not something I enjoy anymore. And I've felt a lot, a lot of loss at things like that. But you either do something about it or you find another thing. So I just fill that hole with other things. You know, I get to train at Gold's Gym, the Mecca. You know, and In Venice? It, yeah. And it's a bit of a zoo. Do you There's, do it outside? Uh, oh, you're thinking of Muscle Beach on the beach? Yes. Yeah, no, that's a totally different gym. Oh, no, no okay. I don't train there. I'm like... I don't want to be that showy. Those guys uh, are nuts. Yeah, some of my friends go down there. There's a, a guy called Ike who's, I think he's Dutch. He's a dark-skinned dude. He's like 6'4", and he's enormous. But he's like fit. Like he can do muscle-ups and like throw himself around full 360 degree and catch the bars. And he's enormous. And I don't know how he does it, but yeah, no, Gold's is like the one set back from the beach. Like Arnold Schwarzenegger says hello to me in the morning and there's a lot of weirdos and randoms, but man, you, this is LA. You just got to accept it. It's Hollywood, baby. Yeah, exactly. So <laughs> I've been going there a long time and all the, the regulars and locals and trainers and all that, all, it's become a second family for me. So I get up in the morning straight away. I go down to the gym. I work out, I see my friends, and that's my socializing. Like, other than that, I'm not a hugely social person. I like quiet. Yeah. Uh, and so after that, I'm done. My social battery's out. And then I, I go home and do some work. I work on a project. I work on a show. Maybe I'll write another book, like all that sort of stuff. And, you know, it's a good life. I'm always looking for more projects to get involved in. Cool. Well, I'm pumped for the next book. Yeah. <laughs> the next kid's book? Yeah. I mean, this one's sick, so. And I'm going to check out Uncaged. I read the other one. Listen to. Yeah. Well, the other one's on uh, Audible as well. Great. So if you just want to drive around and listen to it, you don't have to sit down and read. Yeah. It's, it's hard to find time. Like, I prefer to sit and read, but where do you find the time? You know, I do it before bed, but then I instantly go, fall asleep. So I get like four pages in and i'm already asleep so it takes me six months to finish a damn book yeah so i'm like i'm like you drive around the car it's not like getting anywhere in la is quick so, <laughs> you can listen to it in one yeah, ride <laughs> listen to it while you're driving around but yeah my stupid voice is reading that one as well um but yes yeah, so if you thought there was cool stories in that one right, this is uncaged is the one Hell yeah. Awesome, Paul. Thanks so much for being here. Pleasure, man. Good to see you again. You as well. Guys, all Paul's links are going to be linked down below. Make sure you check them out. Show them love. And thank you. My weights. Out. Cool. Thank, thank you. Pleasure, man.